Trump's attempt to stall his New York trial has failed. That's the trial for claiming hush money he paid to the porn star he cheated with on his wife three months after she gave birth was legal expenses. The New York trial will start 34 counts as planned March 25th. And obviously the implications are that Trump trial air traffic control will now be waving the Stormy Daniels Trump case in for a landing first. And it just told the Trump election subversion case in D.C. to go around and try to set down later. The Trump Georgia 11,780 votes trial is encountering some turbulence, even though the only witness claiming any evidence of anything improper between Fonnie Willis and the extra prosecutor cannot remember how or when she found out about the affair. And remember, the whole purpose of this is the same purpose it always is, stalling. The Trump business fraud case has already landed and might have deplaned yesterday in the same court building as the Trump, what did you do after your son was born? I did Stormy Daniels case, but it didn't. We may hear from Judge Arthur Engeron with the final count and the amount in the second New York trial as early as today. And now the punchline to this brief resume of all the criminal trials and other trials that Trump is currently facing. None of that... None of that is the current Trump legal headline. You do not get to survive to become a 77-year-old deranged malignant narcissist without being really good at controlling your own image. Trump's brain does not work right. To him, other people are just furniture that can move on its own. He has no courage, no conscience, and no conception that the world was not created solely for him. But he's good at controlling his own image. Or at least he was, until he made what could ultimately be a fatal mistake, if the rest of us just jump on it. Because as he yelled at cameras at Manhattan Criminal Court on Center Street in New York yesterday, he made a terrible logistical decision. Whenever Trump has talked to the media that has been separated from him, even by those cold, imposing silver police barricades, the one that looks like the bottom half of a jail cell... Trump has always managed in that situation to position himself in a way in which it is clear that it is the media that is behind the half jail cell barricades and not him behind them. It's simple, really. You stand parallel to those barricades and you make sure you are doing so in such a way that only barricades in front of you are visible. Even the taller barricades will only go up to the belt line of even an average size man as long as they are in front of him. Photographs of Trump will therefore be cropped often, and even if they are not, the barricades just look like ordinary railings. But something happened to Trump yesterday in court. Those police barricades were in front of him and also behind him in a kind of loose octagon shape. Suddenly... There were these half-jail cell bars in front of him, as usual, but also half-jail cell bars behind him, in the distance, so that almost every photo of him and every video of him showed the ones in the back. And thanks to the laws of perspective, they were even with his shoulders, or somewhat higher than his shoulders. And basically, what looked like jail cells could not be cropped out of every photo of Trump. Just to make it worse, Trump, the incredibly good orchestrator of his own image, exacerbated the problem. Somehow, his lawyer stood behind the barricade that was placed perfectly parallel to the two men. And Trump stood to the lawyer's left. And perhaps without ever realizing it, he put himself in one of the corners where the front barricade angled backwards. So, if you have not seen the picture, bars in front of Trump, a second set of bars to the side of Trump stretching from where he stood to back behind him and to the right of him, a third set of bars which sloped back from there in Trump's direction, and then 
the piece de resistance, the fourth set of bars, unmistakable and unavoidable at the height of Trump's shoulders. Trump behind bars. Several times, Trump even put his hands on the railing in front of him, and he might as well have been shouting, Get me out of this prison, you lousy screw! In fact, there is one set of images. The photographer was named Timothy Clary of Agence France Press, and he must have put his camera over his own head, because in his shots, those back bars are literally appearing as if they were above Trump's head. The shot is so wide that you see perhaps two dozen people leaning against walls and standing, staring at Trump, and then in the middle, bars suggesting jail behind him, above his head, bars suggesting jail to his right, bars suggesting jail in front of him. Looking left to right, you see the cop outside the barricades, Trump inside the barricades, lawyer inside the barricades, second cop outside the barricades. Even if it is just on an unconscious level, the photograph screams, Trump in prison. Trump behind bars. Trump guilty. Trump the criminal. Trump indicted. Trump so indicted. Wait. So indicted? Oh, Nancy! I'm so indicted and I just can't fight it. I'm about to go to jail and America likes it. I'm so indicted. My defense ain't airtighted. And I know, I know the unindicted co-conspirators can bite it. Bite it. Thank you, Nancy Faust. More than that, though, for once, it is Trump in that photograph and most of those photographs. It is Trump who is behind bars and everybody else in the shot is free. The court staff, the cops, the media. I'll post the photo on Twitter X and wherever else I can think to. I've never been on trial. I've never actually been a witness or anything else in a courtroom. And only once have I ever been in a deposition. Of course, it was a two-day deposition over an issue of $50 million. And one of the things my very good lawyers for that deposition hammered into me for use in the deposition and any other time I encountered other lawyers, it was a very simple warning. Whatever you do, try not to look guilty. And in the picture, God, does Trump look guilty. I don't know if Nikki Haley's campaign can license that image. It merely proves her last honest point of her campaign that a Trump candidacy will be nothing but him in court. It's like 500 bucks to license the rights to use a photo like that off Getty images. But for a campaign, it would probably be way higher. However, the Biden campaign ought to buy that photo and the rights and the camera and any piece of video shot from that damning angle and hire the cameraman and plaster it everywhere. Trump on trial, you know he's guilty. Your Republican nominee, only with nominee crossed out and defendant written above it in red. On this photographer, Tim Clary, lead pipe cinch Pulitzer Prize. That sound effect, that's what the picture looks like. Meanwhile, a California grand jury has indicted James Comer's and Sean Hannity's and Grandpa Grassley's key FBI informant against the Bidens. He did make all that stuff up. The infamous FD1023 form that Grassley released and Comer tried to sell as real about Burisma and bribing the Bidens And when they went back to the informant and they said that a Burisma official told him in 2015, according to his story, that he'd bribed the Bidens, but it turned out this guy had not met with anybody at Burisma until two years after that, that the timeline didn't work and it was obvious he'd made it up. He just repeated his crap, which was, or sounds awfully like, 
Kremlin composed disinfo. And James Comer and Chuck Grassley and Sean Hannity served as de facto Russian agents in spreading it. And now Alexander Smirnov faces 25 years in prison for lying to the FBI. In Russia, FBI sues you. If they were Democrats, James Comer would have been stripped of his chairmanship by right now, possibly forced out of the House already, and Chuck Grassley would have been in jail years ago. So now, Joe Biden's legal problems have been reduced to just the one. Unfortunately, that one is having an idiot for his attorney general. How Merrick Garland has not resigned yet is beyond me. I assume it's just because, as we saw in the Trump prosecutions, he does nothing quickly or in normal time or even slowly. I presume he cannot go to the bathroom without a six month long series of meetings and consultations first. Well, now Garland's got to act fast and spit or get off the pot. And if he won't, Biden has to fire him again. This political prostitute, Robert Hur, the Trump appointee, and now apparently de facto Trump campaign surrogate, the centerpiece in what Politico aptly named the Biden age plot. Hur is revealing more and more of his plans to try to sink the president, violating all legal ethics, both of them, by including his neurological guesswork about Biden's memory inside a special counsel investigation that, oh, by the way, cleared Biden. That wasn't enough damage to do. That wasn't enough prostitution to perform on behalf of Donald Trump. This bastard her, as I keep repeating here, is actively and not even secretly arranging to testify to at least the House Judiciary Committee, it is now next month. CNN and The Times reported yesterday. Her's congressional testimony is set for March 12th. And somebody on her's side of this equation has spun her's tawdry subhuman question about the president's late son, Beau, as justified because it was Biden and not her who first brought up Beau Biden. Axios also reports that her, quote, has been in discussions with Sarah Isker, the head of public affairs and a senior counselor to Trump's deputy attorney general during the Mueller investigation to help him navigate a congressional hearing. Sarah Isker. Sarah Isker is the Federalist phony who attacked Trump in 2016 for having threatened to prosecute Hillary Clinton and who bashed CNN as fake news and first went to work for Trump as the spokesperson for Attorney General Jeff Sessions, all the while pitching herself for a job with MSNBC and CNN and finally being hired by CNN, which she had called fake news, as political editor. They blew her out quickly over there, and she was last seen at ABC News before she signed on as Robert Hur's assistant henchman in the aptly titled Biden age plot. And now besides this, there is a new twist to the Biden age plot. The New York Times reported that before it was released, the White House pushed back on that report, but did not take any of the actions it or the DOJ could have done to censor that report. Noble, not smart, but noble. The day before the report was released, the DOJ's senior career official, a man named Bradley Weinsheimer, wrote back that hers amateur doctoring and his other political opinions inserted into his report, quote, fall well within the department's standards for public release. The Times does not tell you who this Bradley Weinsheimer is. They describe him as the department's senior career official or non-political appointee. That's bullshit. He is hardly that. He was appointed by George H.W. Bush to the Department of Justice, and he was elevated to his current non-political position under Trump. There is nothing stopping Merrick Garland from stopping them all dead in their tracks, denying the House Judiciary Committee any material and hers testimony. There's nothing stopping him except Garland's own sluggish trees instead of the forest, phony piety about the Department of Justice and law with a capital L. 
Merrick Garland already missed his chance to redact hers utterly uninformed and politically poisoned conspiracy theories. And now we have this Weinsheimer guy involved in this and this Isker involved in this. And it is a little miniature right wing conspiracy. Your Department of Justice, Mr. Garland, it just produced a document in which some idiot from the Federalist Society was permitted to speculate on the president's acuity. James Comey and then Bill Barr had already turned DOJ and its branches into a political whorehouse, and this clown Robert Herr just turned it into a free political whorehouse. Once again, Garland has to shut this down, or Biden has to fire him and take the fallout for doing so, unless I don't know. Jack Smith has threatened to quit if Garland goes. Unless it's something like that, there is no reason to continue to trust Merrick Garland, a foolish, naive man, not just to do the right thing, but but to do anything. Remember when I said that after their Sunday shows deceptively edited quotes from the non-brain parts of the Her report, edited them like you would edit the phrase not guilty into dot, 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 guilty, that they needed to fire their anchors and their anchors' bosses? This is probably a coincidence, but ABC News' president, Kim Godwin, just discovered, hey, there's another ABC News president above her. Deborah O'Connell has been promoted to president, news group, and networks, Disney Entertainment. She has more words in her job, so that means she's boss. This is not necessarily cause and effect. I would actually guess it's not cause and effect. Godwin was reportedly hated at ABC and evinced no earthly clue that she knew what she was doing. But the news president positions, the producers and management at the key shows, they put those people there and keep them there, and it's usually their favorites. They're not so much with the talent, but definitely the producers of shows like Meet the Press and This Week are the people that the Kim Goodwins of this world want there. So those producers, the ones particularly at This Week, all have to be scared right now because their boss is no longer the boss. And by the way, after how they screwed up the her story, good. Two other TV stories. The Washington Post has made a million arteries run cold. A nice little feature on Biden game strategy for the election and why nearly 3% of the $130 million swing states ad buy that they have arranged is going to go for Joe Biden spots in... Omaha, Nebraska, $3,700,000 worth of Biden commercials and Biden ad and Biden streaming stuff in Nebraska. Well, in the second district of Nebraska, that state splits its electoral votes. Four are awarded from the deeply red first district. One is awarded from the deeply Omaha second district. It's kind of blue there. It's a city. I'll just read the rest of the little post story. Under a scenario where Biden wins the three northern swing states and the other uncontested blue states, a loss in Nebraska's second district, well, that could result in a 269-269 tie, kicking the selection of the president to the House where Republicans currently have an advantage in the number of state delegations they control. And remember, if, God help us, the House ever has to decide who's going to be president, each state gets one vote. And right now, the Republicans control 26 state delegations. So you're going to spend 3.7 mil in the Omaha market? Are we sure that's enough? And a year ago today, Tucker Carlson was already in negotiations with Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy. Remember Kevin McCarthy? 
to unleash the greatest blockbuster in the history of American television, the real January 6th tapes, which, of course, turned out to be several days worth of video of empty hallways. So didn't wind up being a full-length Zapruder film. But we didn't know that then, a year ago today. And where is Tucker Carlson now? Filming inside a Moscow supermarket, explaining that Russia is far better than the United States because the prices in the supermarket are so low. Without ever noting that the prices are still two to three times higher than the average Russian can ever afford in his lifetime. Moreover, if you thought Carlson's flatulent, lap-sitting interview with the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin was useless, I hope you saw how it was trashed by a critic named Vladimir Putin. Putin said, I honestly thought he would be aggressive and ask so-called sharp questions, but he chose a different tactic, unquote. What's he implying there? What's the opposite of sharp? dull soft worst yet putin made carlson release their interview unedited and then when it appeared on the russian government's official site they had edited out the really dull parts which turned out to be many of tucker carlson's questions one day you're in the middle of the kremlin praising putin to his face the next day You're praising the prices in the Borscht department at the Moscow Winn-Dixie. So I'd like to congratulate Tucker Carlson, the first broadcaster to my knowledge, who has been fired by CNN, PBS, MSNBC, Fox News, and now by the KGB. Also of interest here, how many different things does Marjorie Taylor Greene not understand? I mean, I suppose the answer is infinite. I mean, she has spent several days congratulating herself now on being named one of the impeachment managers for the trial of Secretary Mayorkas in the Senate, blithely unaware or blithely too stupid to be aware that there is not going to be a trial of Secretary Mayorkas in the Senate. The stunt is over. But yesterday, Marge went back to one of her favorite gaps in her knowledge, vaccines, and she got called out for it, crushed. Thank you, Congressman Robert Garcia of California. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. Olbermann. of us on countdown it's fridays with thurber and we'll get back to the beginning to my mind it is the quintessential thurber story it's the one i heard the actor william windham recite on public television in 1977 in his one man thurber show and i thought i wonder if i could ever have a job that would let me read thurber stories out loud for an audience the perfection of a box to hide in coming up first yes it's the daily roundup of the miscreants morons and dunning kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world the bronze worse nike and major league baseball nike is the new supplier of baseball's uniforms and thus they are the people who have brought everybody in the game into rare agreement Everybody in the game loves to disagree. That's the point about baseball. It's about to end, somebody says. Oh, no, it's never been better, says somebody else. Now we all agree. Young fans, uniform nerds, old reporters now in their seventh decade of going to games, and the players themselves, they are all saying the same thing this February. The new uniforms suck eggs. 
As spring training begins, everybody can see the obvious. The numbers and the player names have been shrunk to near illegibility. Outfielder Taylor Ward of the Angels says they look like replica uniforms. Somebody else said, yeah, they look like replicas at TJ Maxx. But it's worse than that. The hefty and large Angels reliever Carlos Estevez pointed out to reporters that the white in his team's pants does not match the white in his team's shirts. And Estevez says he can't fit into his pants and they will not let him tailor his pants. I feel like I'm wearing someone else's pants. The blue in the Cubs uniforms, according to a Cubs player, does not appear to be the same blue the Cubs have worn since the mid-1950s. And they have screwed up the fabled script Dodgers uniforms of the Los Angeles Dodgers. The shirt used to open, used to button between the O and the middle D in the word Dodgers across the chest. Now it opens in the middle of the O. So if an L.A. player has his top buttons unbuttoned, it really looks like his uniform reads Dodgers. D-O-O-D-G-E-R-S, Dodgers. The next complaint will come from the fans when they find out that the price of one of these replica uniforms has risen to about $400. The runner-up, worser, Marjorie Taylor Barney Rubble, please get your deviated septum fixed green. The first congressperson, dumber than Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons. I'm not a doctor, but I have a Ph.D. in recognizing bullshit when I hear it. It's time to be honest about the vaccine injured. And we need to stop allowing these COVID-19 vaccines to be given Gentle out ladies, to children. Young lady's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Garcia from California for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm sorry you all had to go through that. That was a lot of uh, conspiracy theories and wild accusations, uh, which we now have been uh, debunked by, by medical science. And we should be clear that vaccines work and save lives, and they have millions of lives in this country. Good Lord. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene can't spell Ph.D. Thank you, Congressman Garcia. But our winner, the worst, the Associated Press, you know, for the most concentrated, most absurd both sides of the presidential election, the AP, which is usually just bland and shallow, may have won the award for all of journalism in the month of February. The headline of a story analyzing Congressman-elect Tom Suozzi's victory in the special election in the New York Third, quote, Democrats cheer New York win as good omen for November. But is it enough to calm anxiety over Biden? Ah! The Associated Press, I swear to Jesus, if Kamala Harris discovered a pill guaranteeing everybody eternal life and she was handing them out to everybody on the street, here, take two, somebody would write, Democrats cheer public reaction to their immortality pill, but is it enough to calm anxiety over Biden? Today's worst persons in the world. It's been a long week. And every time I find myself thinking, it's been a long week, I like to turn to my book of James Thurber. And it's Fridays with Thurber, and it's been a few Fridays since I've done any James Thurber. And so let's start at the beginning. As I've mentioned many times, I read this story first aloud in a class in college in 1979, and a friend of mine came up to me and said, you should forget that sportscasting thing. You should read Thurber for a living. And I said, yeah, that'll ever happen. This is, for some reason, salvation for me, catharsis and every other emotion that is appropriate after it has been a long week. A Box to Hide In by James Thurber. I waited till the large woman with the awful hat took up her sack of groceries and went out 
peering at the tomatoes and the lettuce on her way. The clerk asked me what mine was. Have you got a box? I asked. A large box? I want a box to hide in. You want a box? He asked. I want a box to hide in, I said. What do you mean? He said. You mean a big box? I said I meant a big box, big enough to hold me. I haven't got any boxes, he said. Only cottons that cans come in. I tried several other groceries, and none of them had a box big enough for me to hide in. There was nothing for it but to face life out. I didn't feel strong, and I'd had this overpowering desire to hide in a box for a long time. What do you mean you want to hide in this box? One grocer asked me. It's a form of escape, I told him, hiding in a box. It it circumscribes your worries and the range of your anguish. You don't see people either. How in the hell do you eat when you're in this box? Asked the grocer. How in the hell do you get anything to eat? I said I had never been in a box and didn't know, but that that would take care of itself. Well, he said finally, I haven't got any boxes, only some pasteboard cartons that cans come in. It was the same every place. I gave up when it got dark and the groceries closed and hid in my room again. I turned out the light and lay on the bed. You feel better when it gets dark. I could have hid in a closet, I suppose, but people are always opening doors. Somebody would find you in a closet. They would be startled, and you'd have to tell them why you were in the closet. Nobody pays attention to a big box lying on the floor. You could stay in it for days, and nobody'd think to look in it, not even the cleaning woman. My cleaning woman came the next morning and woke me up. I was still feeling bad. I asked her if she knew where I could get a large box. How big a box you want? she asked. I want a box big enough for me to get inside of, I said. She looked at me with big, dim eyes. There's something wrong with her glands. She's awful, but she has a big heart, which makes it worse. She's unbearable. Her husband is sick, and her children are sick, and she is sick, too. I got to thinking how pleasant it would be if I were in a box now and didn't have to see her. I'd be in a box right there in the room, and she wouldn't know. I wondered if you had a desire to bark or laugh when someone who doesn't know walks by the box you're in. Maybe she would have a spell with her heart if I did that and would die right there. The officers and the elevator man and Mr. Grammage would find us. Funny doggone thing happened at the building last night, the doorman would say to his wife. I let in this woman to clean up 10F and she never come out, see? She's never in there more than an hour, but she never come out, see? So when it got time for me to go off duty, why I says to Krennic, who was on the elevator, I says, what the hell you suppose happened to that woman cleans 10F? He says he didn't know. He says he never seen her after he took her up. So I spoke to Mr. Grammage about it. I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Grammage, I says, but there's something funny about that woman cleans 10F. So I told him. So he said we better have a look, and we all three goes up and knocks on the door and rings the bell, see, and nobody answers. So he said we'd have to walk in. So Krennic opened the door, and we walked in, and here was this woman, cleans the apartment, dead as a herring on the floor, and the gentleman that lives there was in a box. The cleaning woman kept looking at me. It was hard to realize she wasn't dead. It's a form of escape, I murmured. What say? she asked, dully. You don't know of any large packing boxes, do you? I asked. No, I don't, she said. I haven't found one yet, but I still have this overpowering urge to hide in a box. Maybe it will go away. Maybe I'll be all right. Maybe it will get worse. It's hard to say. A Box to Hide In by James Thurber
I've done all the damage I can do here. Here are the credits. Most of the music was arranged, produced, and performed by Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel, who are the Countdown musical directors. All orchestration and keyboards by John Philip Chanel. Guitars, bass, and drums by Brian Ray, produced by TKO Brothers. Other Beethoven selections have been arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, and it was written by Mitch Warren Davis and appears courtesy of ESPN Inc. Musical comments from Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer was John Dean, and everything else was pretty much my fault. So that's countdown for this, the 864th day since Donald Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Don't forget to keep arresting him while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is Monday, and until then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.